we want to welcome everybody to our first Pet Factor podcast. Uh, I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany Reeves. Uh, we work at Merrick Animal Hospital, and we wanted to put this together to help educate our clients, but anybody who's really interested in pet health care. Yeah. So uh, we're basically going to be concentrating on information about pet health, wellness care, and the latest things in veterinary medicine. Yep, a lot of new things coming out. Uh, in fact, we got a good new thing out a couple weeks ago. Just started using it in the clinic. It's awesome. It's called Pro Heart 12. Yep. We got it. Yeah, you got it back there. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> this, up here. this is the this is the box that comes in. This is the little vial here. I put it up for the people who are watching us. Can see that if you're listening, too bad. Go watch us on uh, YouTube. Um, so basically, ProHeart 12 is an upgrade from ProHeart 6, which was a six month heartworm uh, preventative. Yeah, this all, lasts twelve months. It's all in the name. Whole year, <laughs> one shot will prevent pre protect the pets from heartworms and intestinal parasites. Nice. So it's labeled for uh, treatment of hookworms, but I've been using this product since the ProHeart 6 came out, and I've seen the intestinal parasites go way down. Uh, I think it's uh, even better than the oral preventatives that I've used. Uh, I've seen, it. and the, the biggest thing is compliance. Yeah. Um, I can give one shot now, and I don't have to worry about a dog missing a heartworm dose for an entire year. I do know a lot of things that most owners do ask, though, given it with other vaccines. Like, it's safe just like the ProHeart 6, so we don't Absolutely. ever really see vaccine reactions with this at all. Um, well, you know, it's, it's a medication, so there can be reactions to it, just like with any shot we give an animal, a vaccine, an injection. Mm -hmm. Most common thing I've seen is just a little irritation at the vaccination site. We don't give it in sick animals. Right. Uh, it's not recommended for really underweight animals because it relies on the fat. So it's got these little micro capsules that you inject and they redistribute to the fat and they slowly release this product over a year. Uh, the other advantage I like over, over the oral uh, preventative is the oral preventative will kill the parasites they picked up during the previous uh, month. So they start growing and living for 30 days and then you give them a pill, kills them. With the ProHeart 12, they don't get to grow. Oh, so it just soon kills as, them off as soon as they get it? As soon as they get the mosquito bite, those larvae move in, the pro heart hits them, kills them dead before they can even start to grow. Right. Um, and be, if you got pets that are allergic to beef, can't give them a beef chew. Yeah. Uh, got animals that don't like to take oral meds, you're fighting with them to get those pills in them. It works really well. So um, in terms of safety, um, even though this product is new to the United States, they've been using it in Australia for almost 20 years. Nice. They're just slowing the pickup. Yeah, it's, it's taken a while to get here. We've had the six-month version for a while, but um, the 12-month the version has been around. Uh, it's been in Europe as well, the, the six months. So this is, now that it's coming here, I think it's going to change the game, mainly because despite the fact that more dogs are in heartworm preventative than ever before, we're still seeing an increase in heartworm disease. Yeah, it's because people drop off and stop doing, like with the six-month, people yeah. would only do it during warm weather which right. well for heartworms here. that's going to be fine one of the big things though that has been um a big spread of heartworms has been the storms we've been having the last few years yeah the pet shelters bring these dogs from down exactly. in texas louisiana florida yeah they come up here where we got homes for them mm -hmm. and they bring these parasites with them yeah so a um, friend of mine practices up in michigan he got a couple of cases of the resistant heartworm infections in some oh. rescue dogs that they had so they had to send those off to get tested when they tested this product, they actually tested in the Mississippi Valley where they have the highest incidence of heartworms and they have these resistant strains and 100% of the dogs were protected. Nice. Um, and I think they went out to like 13 months to just to make sure they've got that little bit of uh, extra protection. there. When can we start giving it for animals? Like a year, six months? Okay. Well, um, the ProHeart 6 is we can use in animals that are six months or older. Right. Uh, ProHeart 12, they have to be 12 months or older. Months or older. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Australia, they do a little bit differently. We actually had an Australian vet come out and talk about it. They actually will give their first injection of ProHeart 12 at three months, okay. a second injection at six months that lasts for nine months, and then they do it 15 months. So you can see it's very safe to use in young animals. Very often, we, yeah. we just use, in the United States, we'll use the ProHeart 6 at six months. So up until then, we'll give them the oral pills. Yeah. Um, and that'll take care of them. But once we can get them to six months when they get spayed or neutered, that's a great time to switch them over to the injectable. Um, like I said, I've been using this product since it first came out in my house call practice and just saw the intestinal parasites drop tremendously. In fact, they offer a guarantee. If your pet is on ProHeart 12 and they've been tested negative for heartworm at least twice in the last, I think, 12 months, and they get heartworms, they will pay for the treatment. Wow. Most companies do this, but they'll they'll cover the cost up to $1,000 for treating the pet for heartworms. And that does not include the cost of the drug. 
Hmm. Do they yep. cover for like intestinal parasites if you get that? They do. In fact, nice. they will cover for intestinal parasites that aren't on their label. So if your pet comes in for their stool sample and they got roundworms or whipworms, they'll pay up to hundred dollars to get those parasites out of them. Oh, so like testing and treatment and everything. Right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And sometimes with a big dog, it can be kind of expensive to treat for some of these parasites. But like I said, I've seen a decreased incidence in all intestinal parasites using this. Um, they're offering a twenty dollar rebate. Okay. Which actually, when you consider the rebate and the cost of the product, the way we price it, it's basically the same cost as or less yeah. than it would be for 12 months of the oral pills, especially in the small dogs. I'll say, yeah, I can see the small dogs being much cheaper. They'll save a lot of money on the small dogs. Or I mean, like even those giant breed, 180, 200 pound dogs, you got to think you're not taking two or three pills. Right. You just one, one shot, yeah, and then you get a rebate on it. So. Right. Um, and uh, the rebate is kind of neat. They go through an online program, and its rebate works on their flea products, a lot of their allergy meds, and other things as well. So it's kind of a neat product. So I'm really excited about this. We've been using it for a couple of weeks. We've already gone through seven bottles of this stuff, <laughs> um, which is pretty amazing. Um, we've ordered four boxes of it, and it's not going to even last us uh, two months. No, not at all. Um, we, we found also that when we were doing seasonal preventative, the intestinal parasites were a problem. Yes, it was. So yeah. certainly heartworms aren't going to be a problem in January, but roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, they're going to pick those up. So um, this is one of the things we want to do in the podcast is bring these new products to people, mm -hmm. let them know what's available, let them know it's safe. Um, yeah. A lot of people do have concerns about giving their pet a long-acting injection. Yeah. I mean, this once you give it, you can't take it out. Yeah. But the safety on this is incredible. They've done multiple times the dose in these animals. Um, to, to see if there's any sort of reactions. Um, and basically, when they compare it to the oral pills, it's basically about the same amount of reactions. Okay. And even though it's injectable, there's been animals that they can get gastrointestinal issues. But you never really know if something's coincidental or not. Because a lot of times we're given this with a vaccine. Yeah. yeah. You don't know if the vaccine caused a reaction or the ProHeart. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I've been using it for so long, the ProHeart 6, I feel very comfortable with this product, and I'm glad they came out with it. I think it's going to be a game changer. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of clients already change to it, and they're really excited. Now we're just it's, waiting for, it's like, not hard. You mentioned it to them. Flea and ticks. And yeah. Once we get that injectable, that'll be so much easier, but we're starting. Don't have that yet. <laughs> but, yet. you know, this, you tell people, hey, we can give one shot and they're protected. Boy, they just love that idea. Oh, yeah. They're getting it done. Yeah, and then you don't have to worry about price matching or going online and getting like a shoddy product or something like you're getting it from the vet just getting it straight from the manufacturer right. itself right and so and, you're getting a good quality and the other thing yeah. about ProHeart is you actually have to be certified to give this so we actually go oh. through a little online training program so we learn uh the indications when to use it when not to use it how to give it how to prepare it so that you know that you're getting it from somebody who's been trained and is proficient in giving this medication and uh, like i said it, it's amazing how easy it is to convince people that this is the way to go. Yeah. All right. Now, podcasts that I've listened to have sponsors. So I was able to find a sponsor for our podcast. Okay. Who yeah. <laughs> this is a new, new company coming out here. <laughs> okay. It's called okay. Animal Planet Fitness. Okay. <laughs> this is a gym for animals. Oh. It's the first no-judgment gym for pets. Perfect for your tubby tabby or dumpy dachshund. <laughs> they encourage you to try their giant exercise wheels, the laser pointer room, that'd be great for cats. Yeah. And the pet parkour park. Oh, those for those pets still working on those abs, that's you know? The obstacles, they can yeah. do all the things, running up the walls. It's good for those who like to spin in circles, get their great. And to top off their workout, they can get a pet massage with Bridget or Heidi. Oh, Bridget and Heidi, good old girl. <laughs> They want you to join, uh, they have fitness classes too. They have a spinning class with toilet paper rolls. Oh. Cats love that. I can't imagine the cleanup from that one. There's tail chasing for beginners. Oh, Frisbee basics. And the ever popular fetching for dummies. Ah. Or they encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with one of their fitness trainers. They have personal trainers. They got Fritz, Kendra, and Josh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> That work off those unwanted pounds and get in shape for the dog beach or that special occasion. You gotta get the doggy speedo and bikini. <laughs> Here's a great thing: they have an animal fitness, animal planet fitness nutrition bar, so you can enjoy before and after your workout. They got flavored water. You know, they got flavored water for people. Yeah. They got bacon, catnip, 
and their most popular tuna. What tuna? Doesn't that tuna water just sound yummy? I'd probably go more for the bacon, the bacon? one. Yeah. yeah. So the catnip might be a little minty. So the catnip one, I and I feel like that should still be illegal. And of course, they have healthy snacks, so that you you can get some good carb loading and protein. You got good liver okay. cookies. Uh, cricket biscuits made from real cricket flour. Oh yeah, that's And then yummy. The, just the catnip brownies. <laughs> Sounds like a special treat for yes. cats. <laughs> Membership's only $19.95 a month. It includes an Animal Planet Fitness bandana for all new members. Visit them at AnimalPlanetFitness.com and let their dedicated team get your pets in the best shape of their lives. Ooh, Animal okay. Planet Fitness, yay! All right, let's move on here. <laughs> Okay, yes, we're laughing a little bit about that, but we gotta have a little fun in here. <laughs> yes. So we got some pet health news stories that I wanna talk about, and this is a really cool one. So, you know how people are allergic to cat, their cats, or yes. can be allergic to cats? Yes. So uh, previously, all you could do is take medicine, medications or get these specially bred cats that are like thousands of dollars that don't have mm -hmm. this gene. Or have a pet rock. They now have a vaccine for cat allergies. For people? No, you actually vaccinate the cat. Okay, there's a protein that the cats produce. It's called FELD1. Yes, it's the one they groom themselves, right? right yes, right. yes. So, what this does, it produces antibodies against that. So, these protein then is bound up by these antibodies and doesn't get shed with their fur. Huh. So, this is a, a Switzerland company that's come up with this. Um, the name of this product, let's see what it is here. It's Hypopet. 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 Okay, I can okay. see that, yeah. Um, and because you're vaccinating the cat, the owners don't have to get a shot. It's great. Is this um, like a one shot and done? Or it doesn't like... really say. I would guess it might be an annual booster like other types of vaccines. Yeah. But, you know, in the U.S., roughly, there's uh, 3 in 10 people with allergies have allergies to pets and yeah. cats, cats and dogs. Cat allergies are actually twice as common as dog allergies. Huh. Okay, both humans and animals benefit from this. Um, the allergic cat owners reduce their risk of developing chronic diseases like asthma, oh. become more tolerant of their cats, and then the cats don't need to be relinquished or sent to a shelter. Oh wow! So I can't wait for shelters. this to come out. This will be a really cool product. This is and this is real. I'm not making this up. This is this is something that we actually have out here. I wonder if that's something I'm going to move towards, like for cat uh, dogs too. Yeah, you know, the dog allergen is a little bit different than the cat allergen because mm -hmm. I think it actually is their, their dander that uh, causes the allergy in dogs. Whereas in cats, it's that protein in their saliva. In the saliva. Yeah, you know, that feel, F E L D 1. Hmm. So when we get more news on that, we'll pass it along to our yeah. listeners. Okay. Um, came across this story about a uh, outbreak of salmonella from pets who have been exposed to pig ears. Uh, you know what those pig ears are? Well, they, they cut off the pig ears and they dry them up and they give them to the dogs as chew treats? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You never chewed on a pig ear before? I'm not chewed on a pig ear. <laughs> You're a fun. Well, okay. And they're supposed to be good for their teeth, I guess. Yeah. But they've had an outbreak in 13 states. Um, people are getting sick from this being by being exposed to their pets that have been no, chewing on these. Um, so the states include California, Illinois, where we are. Indiana next door, Kansas, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, New York, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Um, Iowa's got the uh, the highest number of people, 12. Michigan, New York had seven and six. Um, so what they're encouraging is that contact with pig ear treats is likely the source of the outbreak when they did some testing. And uh, when they, they found that the, these pig ears in some of these pet stores actually had salmonella on them. Oh, so these are like store brought pig ears. Yeah, you, know, like, you find a big bin of them. Yeah. And you just reach in there. So you just, you know, they must have got contaminated somehow. Huh. Uh, salmonella infections in animals cause diarrhea, vomiting, fever, abdominal cramps. Same thing in people. Yeah. So unfortunately, when the animals are exposed, then that's how the, the owner's going to get exposed. So like, how do you treat for the pets for this? Like, do they just get... Antibiotics. Yeah. Antibiotics. Yeah. You can do cultures to see if they've got it, but uh, yeah. typically if the symptoms are there, we'll put them on some antibiotics for that. Um, CDC, Center for Disease Control, has some advice for pet owners. They recommend... Um, Washing your hands with soap and water after handling dog treats. Yeah. I guess that's kind of a good thing. Here's the tough one. Avoid having your dog lick you after they've eaten a treat or food. So you can't, like, tug your animal after? No. Man, no. it's... Oh, it's like, and oh, they said I'm young fine. children, especially those five years or younger, should not touch or eat pet food or treats. That's no fun. I, I There's don't know why they would. There's a lot of dog treats out I, there that look good. Yeah. You can go up to a bin and get a cookie that looks just like a person cookie. The, then the serious thing is that some dogs that are infected with salmonella may not appear to be sick, okay? They can have diarrhea, can contain blood or mucus. 
Uh, and infected animals may seem more tired than usual. They have a fever, and they can even have vomiting. Yeah. You know. So watch out for that. If you've got pig's ears uh, in any of those states, be careful. They probably have gotten a lot of those off the shelves, but just um, maybe find something else until we're sure what's going on with that. I wonder if that's why we've been having so many diarrhea cases. <laughs> people getting pig it ears. It could be. It could be. That's something we're going to start have to start asking people if they've yeah. been exposed to those pig's ears. Now, this is a really sad story. Um, and this is something I think people need to know. Uh, there's been three cases in three different states of animals dying from exposure to toxic algae. Aww. It's a strain of blue-green algae that causes neurologic symptoms in these animals, and it works Aww. very quickly. So there's three dogs that were killed in a North Carolina pond. There's a dog that was killed in a Georgia uh, pond, and a dog from a Texas river. So basically... Um, just got I know. Puppies? Uh, you know, this within you know within a day, these animals were, were sick, and some of them within hours. Um, uh, their health deteriorated very quickly. They started seizing. Did they say where the algae is coming from? Is it just from sitting there? You know, it's 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 around, but it causes these blooms, and it can discolor the water, so the water can look um, greenish or bluish or brown. I remember seeing these cloudy. pictures. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so basically, the the owners want to make sure we warn people about this. It can be in stagnant ponds. It was one case it was in a river. So letting your dogs just go swimming in a pond, maybe not the best idea. Yeah, no. Uh, try and avoid that. Um, in the Texas, it was, let's see, it was the Guadalupe River. That was back at the end of July. So, oh. and the dog loves the water. And dogs love to swim. Yeah, just a dog who wants to go out swimming but and playing in water. They drink water when they're out swimming. Yeah. And that's how they get exposed to it. They also found it, they were testing uh, two New York City parks. And they found um, this, wow. this blue-green algae in those ponds. And uh, so they're just warning people and pets to stay out of them. Wow, and this is New York City. Wow. Yeah. So it's just toxic algae is just a, a miserable thing to, to be exposed to. All right. Um, and then let's see what we've got here. Another story oh, here. Where's the bulldog story? Here we go. Okay. So did you hear about this one? Let's see, Bulldog swallows up. No, I did not. Now, do you remember Winston Churchill who came in our clinic? Yes. <laughs> so Winston came in and he had swallowed two pacifiers. Two. Not to be outdone. <laughs> okay, a Boston Veterinary Hospital got quite a surprise recently when her family brought their bulldog in after he stopped eating. So he went into their regular veterinarian and they you know, thought he was just kind of had an upset stomach, prescribed him some medication, did not get better. Hmm. And eventually he stopped eating. So then they took him to Angel Memorial, this big clinic in, in Boston, and they took an x-ray and they discovered all these pacifiers in his stomach. So Winston had two. And this poor three-year-old Mortimer. Had 19 pacifiers in 19. his stomach. Do, do you not realize you're missing 19? It's not one. He's been eating them apparently for weeks. <laughs> and so and they just, just go out and up. buy more? The pacifiers yeah. aren't cheap. I, 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 <laughs> They would wonder what the kids were like, doing with oh, them. Oh, I lost my car. I'm just going to go buy a new one. Okay. So they were actually able to get them out through the stomach, through the, through a, an endoscopy. So oh, so no cutting, no Didn't actual... have to go in. Wow. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Winston, he is, has made all the way down to the intestinal tract, and so <laughs> we ended stuck. up uh, cutting that open. So um, I guess watch your baby pacifiers. Make sure they're clean. Maybe they were covered with bacon or something. Yeah. I, I have no idea. Okay, Cheese, first of all, baby food. how you swallow one of those whole, I have no idea how you even get that down your throat. No. Because pacifiers aren't small either. So for a And I can see dog, if you have 19 pacifiers, you're telling me how it's hard to eat. Oh. <laughs> all right. So we've all heard about the hurricane that hit the Bahamas. Yes. Here's a, a really yeah, heart-wrenching, heart interesting story um, about this woman. Um, so uh, residents across the Bahamas braced for Hurricane Dur Dur Dorian. One woman's preparations stood out. She opened her home to 97 dogs. Wow. 79 of them were inside her master bedroom. Their name is Chella Phillips, and she posted this on Facebook last Sunday. And she said it's been a totally insane situation. She runs a refugee, a refuge, uh, sorry, it's not a refugee. refugee. She runs a refuge for homeless and abandoned dogs, the voiceless dogs of Nassan, Bahamas. Uh, and the day she opened her home to nearly 100 animals also marked the refuge's fourth anniversary. So it's kind of nice. Yeah. She's helped over a thousand dogs in the last four years. Oh, good Pretty for amazing. Her. But can you imagine being in this house with almost a hundred dogs? This can't, can't be that big a house. I'm looking at some of these pictures, and these yeah. dogs are just stacked on top of one another. Yeah. 
and the, the, there's noise going on, the dogs are scared, the power goes out. They said after a while, the, the all their TVs got fried, so they couldn't even show them cartoons. Oh, come on. <laughs> no cartoons the, kids like for to watch the cartoons. sick dogs. Aw. And did, and did they lose all power? Yeah. Oh, so there's but, nothing. But the amazing thing is these dogs got along together. They weren't fighting. They weren't tearing at each other. That's good. They were just welcoming each other in as they're taking care of each other. That just shows animals are better than people. Yeah. We would have been so, in fights huge if there was a support, bunch of people. Like the, the post was shared 67,000 likes and hundreds of comments. So just kind of an amazing thing. So congratulations yeah. to Chella Phillips about um, yeah. her work in the Bahamas. Good and, work. Keep doing it. Yeah. Doing good things. Now, I know you wanted to have a little talk about something uh, regarding uh, pet care. Yeah. Um, so we know is during the summertime, dogs are out. They're playing. They're going swimming. Um, they're getting groomed. But one thing that we're seeing commonly around this time, ear infections. Yeah, gosh. Um, so people don't think when you give your dog a bath, you put them in the bathtub or you put them in the pool, let them swim. You don't think that that water is getting in there, especially dogs with floppy ears. Yeah. And, some dogs, their ears are magnets for uh-huh. that. Uh-huh. And that water just gets in there and sits there and causes infection and just feeds that bacteria overgrowth. Um, so I actually just gave my dog a bath and I had to clean his ears out. And before that, we had an appointment, ear infection. Dog was groomed. What happened? Ear infection. Um, so just one of those tips, you know, if you have to give your dog a bath, put a little cotton ball in it just to help absorb that water. Or if you're going to the groomers, you know, just tell them to keep a close eye out for those ears. Or, you know, get an over-the-counter um, ear cleaner or from your veterinarian, an ear cleaner, and clean those ears really well after doing any type of um, water. Even if they're outside for walks in the rain or winter's coming yeah. if they're playing in the playing snow. Playing in the sprinkler. Uh-huh, playing in the sprinkler. Mm-hmm. My old dog used to bury her head in the snow. Do you ever, uh, like, put anything in their ears before you bathe them, like a cotton ball or something to keep Usually, them like, a cotton ball or two, depending on how big the ear canals are. Okay. Um, but, yeah, just a little cotton ball in there to absorb it. I've heard some people use, like, an ear powder or something to help dry them out afterwards. Yeah, they have, like, peppermint powders that could... Smells good. <laughs> so, it but, helps. Which is wiping them out with even just a cotton ball or paper towel is better than leaving the moisture in there. Mm-hmm. And then um, they get painful ears, stinky ears. Ear infections shaking. hurt like crazy. Uh, yeah. I know my son had a swimmer's ear a couple of years ago. He couldn't sleep. Yeah, they Same thing. It's a ooh. yeast infection with, with the staff. And these uh, ear infections are not contagious, but the organisms live on their skin. And when mm-hmm. they get the right environment, they overgrow. Yeah. So... In order to make our jobs easier and not see all these ear infections, keep your pet's ears dry. Yeah. Uh, when you're swimming, make sure you dry them out really good afterwards. Mm-hmm. When they're bathing, protect them with a cotton ball yep. ahead of time, and then dry them out after you take the cotton ball out, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. That sounds like simply common sense things that the people can do. Yeah. Uh, I know some dogs are, are really prone to allergy problems with ears, so yeah. just regular cleaning could yeah, be Yeah, just routine cleaning, maybe one or two times a week. Sometimes we have some owners that... Do it about once a day, but, you know, who remembers to do that once a day yeah. or if the pet's going to let you. Um, so, you know, two, three times a week is going to help. It's going to help keep the ear infections further apart. And, you know, again, just after anything in water, you know, you dry yourself off. So why not dry your pet or clean your ear, right. their ears out? You know, you go swimming, you try to get the water out of your ears. Why leave it in their ears? And if you find your pet has an ear infection, so if they're shaking their head... Scratching at their ears, you notice the odor, or you actually mm-hmm. see the the junk and the redness in their ears. Get them to the vet right away. Yeah, they're painful they'll, and they're not just going to go away. They need to get treated. and They need pain medication. Like I said, it's yep. very painful, and I always make sure the dog gets some pain medication when they go home because I know it's going to be sore. It's ouchy. Okay, well that's all we have for this week's uh, uh, pet factor. Um, Toby. Oh no, you're right. We got one more thing. All right. So one of the things we're going to do is called the um, pet. Pet of the uh, pet of the week. What yeah. are we going to call it? Pet case of the week. Case of the week. So yeah. this is a medical case that we saw in the clinic this week that we thought would be interesting to bring to our, our listeners and viewers. Um, so this is a dog that I actually saw yesterday. Name is Toby, twelve year old poodle mix, little guy, mm-hmm. about ten pounds long. So for the last week, Toby has had a sore on his neck. So there was a little bit of blood coming out of there. It was really tender and kind of painful to the touch. Owner thought you know there was an infection, maybe a ruptured cyst brought them in to be taken care of. So, of course, I, I was thinking 12-year-old dog is probably sebaceous. Yeah. 
Um, so I had him in the exam room, and I could see this sore on his neck, and it looked bloody, and I could see the stuff, and I was feeling it. It felt kind of weird, not like a regular sebaceous cyst. Regular sebaceous cysts, when they, they rupture, you can feel it kind of small. This kind of had like a little pocket in it. So I was just gently squeezing on it. The next thing you know, <laughs> out squirts <laughs> this cuter rebra larva, this fly larva. Splattered blood on the owner. Oh, no. All over the table, all over the floor. <laughs> And this little larva is crawling along on a table. It's not oh. little. This thing is like an inch long. Oh, and it was in the do in the neck. It was in the neck, and it creates this little breathing hole. They're called oh. cuterira. They come from the bot fly, and this was in the dog's neck. The owner was terrific about it. I offered to pay for her cleaning her <laughs> sweater, and she said it was fine. It was going to be okay, but oh, she was just no. happy that we figured out what was going on with the dog. Oh, you know what? It's common. A week ago, one of the other doctors had three in one dog. Yep. It was a little four-pound chihuahua who only goes outside for maybe five or ten minutes, sits with the owner, and the owner came in one night. It was like, oh, he's bleeding. There were three sores on the dog, and we were like, what is happening yeah. to this poor four-pound chihuahua? It could look like a bite wounds, maybe? Yeah, and, well, he had a dental, so we like, maybe abscessing or something, because one was along the jawline. Okay, sure. And sure enough, doctor squeezed one... And the, the worm came out. And so we sedated because it was very, very painful for right. him. And the doctor had to go in and, like, squeeze out two other worms from two other locations. Yeah. And it was just crazy that a four-pound dog had three worms. Like, it was almost a worm per pound. It was yeah. crazy. Well, they get these. The, the, the flies lay their uh, eggs at the entrances to the uh, the rabbit uh, like burrows. The burrows. So when the animals stick their heads in to try and get the rabbit, then they get onto them. Oh, they can get in through their mouth or their nose. No. There's been cases where they pull them out of cats' noses. Oh. Um, they can get through an open wound. They can migrate yeah. through the tissues. Um, they're most common in um, July, August, and September. Which kind of makes it? sense because yeah. it's been August and September that we've been seeing these. Uh -huh. um, and they can, you know, you have you should take your pet to the vet if you suspect this. They need to be removed carefully. Uh, if the if the um, larva gets uh, squeezed and, and uh, ruptures in there, it can cause an allergic reaction. So if that happens, you want to make sure you're in the veterinary clinic so you yeah. can treat it. And, of course, they can become infected as well. So we put Toby on some antibiotics and some pain medicine, and he'll mm -hmm. probably be fine. But he's certainly going to be at risk for picking these up because <laughs> wherever he got them in his yard, they're, they're still there. Yeah, they're still there. So it's really kind of neat. Uh, the thing is just crawling on the table, really disgusting. Um I don't, I don't want to show anybody the video of this. It's going to make you lose your lunch. You um, should Google them. No, they're really fun to look Google, at. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've heard of people getting infected with these, too. So it's really oh. kind of gross. You putting your hand in a rabbit burrow? I don't know. But they're found all over the world. So uh, who knows? Okay. Yeah, maybe you're reaching in for something. Maybe you dropped your beer can down a hole or something. I don't yeah, know. Face first. I that could happen. Okay. Yeah. Now I think we're done. Yes. Yes, okay. now we are done. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and, and checking out our first podcast here. We're going to be putting one out every week. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of uh, health and wellness topics. Yep. So I think next week we're going to talk a little bit about uh, vaccines and dogs. Okay. So if you're interested in learning um, what vaccines we recommend for your dogs, why we vaccinate your dogs, yep. and uh, why your dog needs these vaccines, that'd be a good one. The importance of them. Yeah. So let's say uh, goodbye, and we'll see you next time. Bye.